Hello, everyone. This is Nate from Soul Nate. Uh, it's my turn to host the Tales from the Triptych. Um, I'm here with uh, the other members of the Triptych. Hello, everyone. This is Nate from Soul Nate. Uh, oh, it's my I've turn to host the Tales from the Triptych. Um, I'm here with uh, the other members of the trip. Hello, everyone. This is Nate from Soul Nate. Oh. Uh, there we go. We get our technical difficulties out of the way right yeah. at the beginning. I'm not sure what's happening with that. Um, let me see. It Has that stopped now? Quit. Yep, I think yeah. it's stopped. Yep, I think it's stopped. Great. Um, fantastic way to begin. Um, I'm here with Patrick and Katie. Uh, hello, Patrick. Hello, Katie. How are you both? Good. How are you? Great. Um, well, as you know, we're talking about um, enamel techniques today, um, cloisonne, plicageur, and champlevé. There are some nice French words in my Kiwi accent. I know Angela in the chat just said she wanted to hear those words in my accent, so there you go. Um, and Katie and Patrick and I had discussed when we were talking about the triptych that we would eventually be talking about topics that we didn't know anything about. And that is exactly what's happening today. I know very, very little about um, these enamel techniques. Um, I've done a lot of research and I have found every second page contradicts the first and every third contradicts them both. So we are all on a steep learning curve here today. Um, one of the first questions that I actually Googled was um, this. How can you tell old cloisonne from new? And it says, consider a modern cloisonne piece. It may have an uneven or pale surface color or may have raised, bumpy, or detached cloisons. Compare that to an 18th century piece that has a smooth texture, though probably aged and vivid colors. And although I have come across a few pieces that could be considered bumpy um, or have a pale surface color, um, Almost every piece that I have seen that is what we would consider vintage, um, made in the last 50 years, has um, a very bright color and a very smooth texture. And it's those pieces that are uh, been identified as having age, have a surface that does look like it has um, been through age, where the colors themselves are more muted, there are small scratches on the surface um, that indicate that it has been around for a while. So this was the first part of my research, um, asking the internet this one question. And I was not disappointed that pretty much every question that I asked thereafter was contrary and contradictory. Well, I don't think that one should count because isn't it a school a school rule that you can't define a word while using the same word in the definition? So to buy, if you can define cloison A and use the word cloison within it, I don't. I think that should just be thrown away. Yeah, that's a great. <laughs> These are my only two pieces of cloison A. This is a cigarette holder and a toothpick holder that I bought from a charity store about or well, maybe 10 years ago now i can't remember i can't remember what i paid for them um it was very inexpensive but these are the, this is the sum total of soul Nate's collection of closing name now at the time you bought those nate did you know or suspect they were vintage did they tell you like what kind of techniques did you use when you found it um i, I simply because i i knew that they were cloisonne um the the texture of them looked like they had some age, although there's no damage evident on either piece. Um, there was a certain dullness that made me think that it had been around for 50 years, 60 years, maybe. Um, that was basically it. I thought they were really pretty pieces. I thought it's they were very inexpensive. It's one of the reasons I don't really carry it all that much is because I cannot tell the difference between a vintage or a contemporary piece, unless yeah. it's something super obvious. Yeah, indeed. You know, the indeed. brass looks a little bit more uh, patinated, you know, which probably make, does look a little bit older. But in general, uh, you know, current pieces are made so well now, um, but really well-made pieces from the past. You know, it, you yeah. can't just go by how well they're made. Indeed. 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 And so the it's pieces made in the 18th and 19th century um, were of an incredible class of workmanship. 
even earlier pieces have an incredible class of workmanship as well. So I, it is a minefield in actually dating Clazone pieces. I won't really be attempting to um, date pieces um, in this particular talk. Um, I simply can't do it. What I plan to do is talk about um, uh, Japanese versus Chinese Clazone and how to identify one against each other. I'll talk a little bit about Champlevé enameling techniques, although there is very little information about that online. And I will talk about Plicajur enameling techniques. Um, I've talked to a couple of other YouTube channels. Austin from Best I Can Afford Antiques has an incredibly good channel. He was kind enough, most gracious, to allow me to show one of his videos here. He has only about 270 to 300 subscribers, which is a crime. His, um, his channel is so interesting. His content is so amazing. So I hope that you go and um, subscribe to his channel. I'll drop his link in while his video is playing. There's also another uh, video that a, a YouTuber has been kind enough to let me show. That's Karen Trexler. Um, and her channel name is Cool Tools Video, and she makes a pair of Plicajour earrings, which I think um, shows the Plicajour process absolutely wonderfully. So I'll drop her link as well when um, I get to show her video. Um, here's a few um, pictures here of um, Chinese, uh, old Chinese uh, people making um, clazone. Now the oldest known pieces of Clazone are from um, Egypt, from ancient Egypt, about 1800 BCE. Uh, the Egyptians tended to use uh, precious and semi-precious stones and set into metal, um, but as they were still now called, uh, considered to be cloisons, cells that they're set into, um, they are considered cloisonne. Cloisonne itself um, translates into to cloison, into cell, or to, in partition in French. Um, some of the earliest examples of what we would now call cloisonne are from the uh, Mycenaean era, that's the Greek, there are six Mycenaean rings. Um, they're dated to about 13th century BCE. Uh, the Great Western period, the Byzantine uh, Empire was about 10 to 12, 10 to 12th century um, AD. China was widely producing during the Ming dynasties, that's 1368 to 1644 and the Qing dynasty of 1644 to 1911, 1912. Um, Japan also produced Clazone. Um, you, in the Meiji period was probably the highest um, production and that's about 1868 to about 1912. Um, what I'll be doing is showing you some of the ways to identify Japanese versus Chinese clazone by looking at the borders and the grounds. Um, but first off, I do want to show this particular piece. This is a magnificent piece of Chinese Qing Dynasty clazone. They um, stand about six foot high. They are cranes. It's an incense burner. This sold in 2010 for a record 129.5 million Hong Kong Whoa. dollars. Magnificent piece. So we're going to move on to the Clazone process. You can see I have a plethora of tabs here. I've taken screenshots uh, from a number of different videos to try and um, indicate the process that Clazone goes through. So it starts off with planning, um, planning on paper. Um, these designs are planned out by people who, um, whose only job is it is to plan new designs. And you can see after that, it starts a process of finely bending this wide yet thin copper wire and matching that with the actual designs on the paper. At the same time, the body of the piece is being made. Most Chinese pieces are made from a copper body. Um, they're hammered out and they're formed into this particular one as a vase. And then the cloisons themselves are started to be attached to the piece. 
they are actually glued on to the piece. Um, it is a glue called um, Belita, mm, Belitia glue. It's from a hyacinth orchid. The bulb of a hyacinth orchid makes this particularly strong glue. And these already bent and twisted wires are delicately laid out to create the design following lines that have been drawn onto the piece. Do you know, is that the glue they're still using today or that's where this technique originated? No, they still use this, this that glue today. Um, it's from not, a hyacinth it's, bulb? From a high, it's, it's, it's an orchid bulb, but it's a hyacinth orchid. And the hyacinth name is about the shape of the orchid flower. So do they bottle this up and, and send it to these particular craftsmen? I presume that there are great quantities of them grown for nothing else but the purpose of cloisonne making. Fascinating. That, the, that's um, amazing in and of itself. Now, this would also be, I'm assuming some of the contemporary, although this is contemporary, but the mass produced pieces, that can't be used. That's got to be like Elmer's glue or something because I, I, it I seems like that would be super expensive to get glue from a orchid bulb. Yeah. Yeah, po quite possibly. Um, there's a lot of information I simply couldn't find out and a lot of questions I simply didn't ask myself over. So it's quite possible that cheaper pieces or more modern pieces have completely bypassed this natural glue. And here's some of the more finished products where the cloisons are completely attached. This is actually a phoenix figure. Now, it has its first firing, and its first firing actually um, melts those two pieces of copper together permanently. <coughs> Excuse me. And after that first firing, it goes on to the coloring. Now, the coloring, it's, a, it's glass. It's ground glass that's put with a liquid, and it is gently piped on <coughs> to the um, copper piece the colorization, this particular piece is considered the most important step in the process of making the cloisonne pieces. Um, even the most modest pieces have an enormous amount of time and man woman slash woman power put into them. Um, some pieces are, go through the hands of 10 master craftsmen who handle them over 100 times each. Um, there are many firings and even a modest piece like this particular vase that we're looking at um, has a production time of three to four months. So when you see that cloisonne vase at that yard sale or at that auction, um, think about the fact that a, an enormous amount of time and um, artisanship and work has gone into these pieces something that i never appreciated truly before i started doing this research no oh, that's amazing now why would it go through the multiple firings do they fire each cell and that color or why would there be multiples that's a question i tried to find out and i think it's because the um the minerals that uh, help go and color these different glasses um, fires at different temperatures. It, it was very difficult to ascertain why oh, okay. there were so many firings um, and what temperatures they were. I know that one particularly mentioned that it was a firing temperature of about 600 to 700 deg degrees Celsius. They have a palette of about 3,000 colors now um, to use. Uh, when they were starting in um, early days in China, there was often almost always a light blue ground color. Um, early, the early examples were mainly floral designs. Uh, the wires and the underside and the lips of vases were gilt. Uh, through the 16th to 17th century, more colors were added to the palette. Uh, they began doing um, designs of figures and dragons. And even into the 18th century, more design improvement and even greater color palette to choose from. Now, Nate, with the glazing here, I see that they're using a little dropper to put in the glaze within each individual cell. So... How many of the droppings do they have to do? I know with regular pottery, sometimes you have to put the glaze on multiple times to get the desired 
uh, colors. Well, I think it's it seems to be that they do this until they fill that particular cloison with um, a certain level of the the enamel glass itself. You can see at the top of this pitch here that it looks like it's pretty much filled to the top, whereas it's still not quite at the top here and empty here. Yeah, Crystal's yeah. also making a point from, oh my goodness, it's vintage, that in some cases it you might be firing as you fill each cell so that as you turn the piece, the enamel, the, the slurry doesn't run out. Yeah, quite, quite possibly. Um, they talk about, um, I, one gentleman I watched on a video talked about the fact that um, it could not be touched once it was put in. So it may simply be the fact that they they fill in a section, they fire it so that they can actually have somewhere to hold on to the piece while they fill in another section. That's quite possible. This is a picture of a very large piece being fired. And these are two exact uh, images, they're exactly the same vase at different periods of cooling down. After it is completely fired, this quite hazy image is the piece being put on a wheel, like a lathe, and it is sanded with um, various grades of soapstone, which progressively polish the piece more and more. It's bathed and polished until it's um, completely finished. Now, let me just see. I expected my last image here to be the video from Austin, which it's not. So I will find that very quickly. It's almost unfortunate that something that's this beautiful that was done in so many different steps is now replicated and put on the shelves of Hobby Lobby for like five bucks. Yeah, I know. Right. It's it's yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure when you put them side by side, they'd be very, you know, very obvious. One is a piece of art, the other is a piece of mass-produced decor. But I had no idea the time that would go into one of those original, one of the handmade pieces. No, right. I didn't either, Patrick. Just marvelous. So this is his um, Austin's. Austin's video from Best I Can Afford Antiques. It runs for about 25 minutes. It's fascinating. If you get a chance to go and subscribe to his channel, I'd really appreciate that. He's got 552 subscribers now. He should be in, in the thousands. Absolutely fascinating. So we'll watch this for a bit. Afford Antiques channel. Um, <clears throat> Before we go too far, I'd like to remind you that uh, if you'd like, you could subscribe to my channel. And uh, it'll tell you when I upload a new video, we're going to talk about something pretty interesting today, but I like to think that many of my videos have displayed and educated people about many beautiful and neat objects. So if you'd like to subscribe, it doesn't cost you anything, and you might end up learning something. So today, we're going to talk about Chinese and Japanese cloisonnet. This is a uh, somewhat unfair comparison because I do not have as nice of Chinese cloisonne as I do Japanese cloisonne. Now, these are nice pieces. It's just that, um, you know, I don't own anything from like the Ming Dynasty or, you know, I don't think even the 1800s as far as Chinese cloisonne goes. But I do own some pretty fair representations of Chinese cloisonne, so I think we can successfully have this conversation. And uh, we can learn a thing or two. <clears throat> There's still things common to uh, Chinese cloisonne that were common to Chinese cloisonne a long time ago. Um, let's discuss differences, um, general differences first, okay? So right here we've got sitting some, uh, some little pieces. And we'll talk briefly about little um, borders and fences and stuff like that. Oh my goodness. 
I knew that little swan or goose was going to fall over. I knew I shouldn't have put him in front of anybody because they don't exactly stand uh, firmly on their own. Okay, so um, let's talk about this specific border first. Because this is common to Chinese cloisonne um, since the beginning of Chinese cloisonne almost. Uh, I could be slightly wrong about that, but I think that's been a very common border on Chinese cloisonne for a long time. I think it's called a ruyi. Um, it's something like that. I forget the uh, Asian word for it, but a lot of people just call it the mushroom border. So when you're looking at Chinese cloisonne, typically you'll find a mushroom border, or sometimes at least. Um, these are usually feathers, and they're fairly common for uh, Chinese cloisonne as well. And again, you'll see the mushroom border repeated right here. And this is kind of in the vein of older Chinese cloisonne. Uh, Chinese cloisonne will typically have at least something in the background. It may not be um, background cloisons as much as it may be designs. Um, and this is... You know, this is a clever way to hold the cloy or hold the enamel in place. We should talk about enamel just a little bit, especially if you're just learning about this stuff. <clears throat> enamel is crushed glass and minerals in a liquid or paste form. So what they would do is they would start with this metal vase right here, okay? This entire thing. And uh, they would draw the pictures in wire you can see the wires, you can see the shine, and they would uh, paste or solder these to the outside of the surface, and then they would fill it in with the uh, paste or liquid enamel. And once they've got this filled in to the color they want it to be, they'll fire it, and that hardens it, and then they sand it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's quite a few processes. And then if you want like slightly different colors like this, sometimes you would have to add a color, um, bake it, sand it, come back to it, and you know add more of whatever color or shade you wanted, so on and so forth. So yeah, um, you know a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of Chinese cloisonne has background cloisons, which are these little cloud shapes right here, and. Um, I've asked my friend Chris Pressing to uh, post his blog um, link in the comments, and uh, hopefully he'll do that because <sighs> he's a wealth of information about uh, you know different cloud patterns and different cloison patterns and all sorts of stuff. So I mean I don't claim to know everything, and there's a lot of people who know a lot more than me. So so really just use any resource you can, and uh, you'll just be better off. So yeah, these are background cloisons, um, some kind, sometimes called diapers, actually, which is kind of weird, but but it's to stop the liquid from running down. So I mean, I guess uh, I guess that'll apply. So yeah, then we come back to this one, and this is actually a little more keeping in style with um, like older cloisonne from China, because you kind of have instead of the background cloisons, you've kind of got like a sweeping design that would serve the same purpose as uh, background cloisons would. I realize now, I don't think I have any water in this room. And since I'm talking like, you know, just expelling a ton of air, my mouth tends to get pretty dry. <clears throat> so you do find, um, you do find background cloisons in some pieces. Uh, you'll find it in early Japanese pieces um, which are basically just imitations of Chinese cloisonne. Like uh, the first, the first uh, Japanese cloisonne started because a Chinese, or I mean a Japanese, um, did I say the first Japanese cloisonne? Okay, the first Japanese cloisonne started because a samurai who wasn't getting paid enough took apart a piece of Japanese cloisonne, or I mean Chinese cloisonne, oh my word, and uh, learned how to make it. Now, now, usually in Japanese cloisonne, if you do see background cloisons on a uh, somewhat less antique piece, there'll be these swirly gigs like this instead of uh, cloud shapes or anything like that. 
Now, the Japanese did use cloud shapes, but it wasn't as common, and uh, it was only until they kind of found their own footing in Japanese cloisonne. So once they once they started, you know, doing things on their own as opposed to imitating Chinese cloisonne, that's when they really started uh, branching out and making different kinds of pictures and stuff. So, so um, I think that that little green one right there, you know, it's a shame because I don't have any, you know, antique pieces of Chinese cloisonne, but I'm trying to, you know use the best pieces I have to compare with older pieces of poisoning. So something like this with, um, with just a bunch of cloisons all around it, that would also be somewhat more similar to an antique piece of Chinese cloisoning. Not necessarily um, background cloisons throughout the whole piece, more like the design allows it to have the diapers or background cloisons, partitions, however you will. And in this one, you can see the wires pretty well. So yeah, um, sometimes, sometimes the older Chinese cloisonne will bear some resemblance to this, just because, like I said, they're not using background cloisons to uh, <clears throat> to support everything. They're using the design of the piece to do that. So you'll see here again, we've got the mushroom um, border. And uh, at the top too, and then still throughout this piece, even though it kind of has a representation of an open background, you'll note that there's still cloisons going through these enamel layers, and it's just because um, you know I think uh, I think the Chinese haven't still haven't perfected the technique of making like big open borders. So you know there's all this green over here. And that's actually sort of a wireless technique there. Uh, you can see there's no wire that separates this tree from, <laughs> sorry, my dog talks. I don't know if you heard him or not. You can see there's no cloisonne or cloison that separates this tree from the water in the background or sky, whichever it may be. I think sky, because these look like mountains, don't they? So, um, so yeah, uh, you'll notice again, there's a bunch of cloisons in the background and that helps keep everything in place. I, I believe, especially as they fire it. So yeah, um, let's just keep talking about this. Over here, you can see uh, very typical cloud shapes. I mean, these are the cloisons. Oh, stupid goose again. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to move that thing again. He's very front heavy. Okay, I'm going to set him over there because it's not even that important that we talk about him. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of different cloud patterns here. And these are uh, 20th century. You'll note that this one is slightly different. It almost looks like a paw more than it looks like a cloud. So, I mean, you'll find different ones, and different ones can be from different times. Um, these are all definitely 20th century pieces. Um, I would even say late 20th century pieces, 1950s and up. So, uh, so yeah, that's just where you are on that. Um, this little guy is actually pretty neat. I like, I enjoy this turtle quite a bit. He's got little scale cloisons. He's got a little, I assume, Buddhist symbol or something like that. He's got little uh, cloisons to denote his scaly shell and stuff. And on the bottom, he's actually got neat little cloisons, too. So, yeah, uh, Chinese, Chinese cloisonne is animals a uh, fair bit of the time. I've seen a lot, a lot of different animals. Um, they definitely liked making birds. Uh, and again, you know, I wish... Uh, I wish we had some older pieces of Chinese cloisonne. If anyone ever wants to donate some older pieces of Chinese cloisonne to my channel, <laughs> I hear about you. Oh my goodness. It's okay. It's okay. We only tipped over the Chinese birds. Um, these aren't worth that much. Uh, my camera's very oddly proportioned on this stand, so that's, that's my fault. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again with the Japanese stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, the comparison is that I've gotten 
I've gotten the um, Chinese clothes and I have mostly at garage sales and stuff for quarters, you know, dollars. Um, and it's not worth an incredible amount. I mean, these pieces are worth something. They're, they're of value. It's just not uh, anything that's going to change your life until you get to the older pieces. And then you can really start to see some dividends. Um, so yeah, uh, Chinese cloisonne, a lot more common to have animals from Chinese cloisonne. So if you see a Chinese, or if you see a bird that's cloisonne, it's probably Chinese, almost a guarantee. Um, so then we've got this big, uh, this is my biggest piece of Chinese clay. In fact, this is, I think, the biggest thing I own um, as far as vases or anything like that. But again, you'll see that all throughout the background of this piece, even though it's large, uh, they've had to um, support the enamel for the background by putting just a ton of designs and stuff all over it. It's very busy. You know what I mean? It's um, It's got something going on, and that's pretty much the rule for Chinese cloisonne. It'll have something going on in the background at, at all segments. So... So that's that. And then we'll come to an early Japanese piece. Um, I don't think this would have been like one of the first pieces or anything, but this is an early piece, and there are still Chinese themes, I would say. Even though I've never seen specifically this um, style of border, I, I've, I've never seen this style of border, uh, Chinese, Japanese, anywhere. So if anyone wants to show me more of this style of piece, I'd be happy to see it. But um, we can tell because of the uh, the um, less polished enamel, first off. Um, the background cloisons, uh, not background cloisons, um, the shading, the enamel shading, and these flower colors are very common to Japanese enamel. Kind of a light pink that fades into white and... Uh, Really, just everything about this looks Japanese to me. And if we were to turn it around, um, which we'll very carefully, very carefully just pick it up and let you see briefly the back of the plate. Chargers, uh, plates, um, bowls, stuff like that. If they're Japanese, sometimes they'll have this swirl pattern. Sometimes they'll have a scale pattern. Um, but this is almost definitely going to be a Japanese plate if you turn it around. <clears throat> and uh, that dates it to pretty much the Meiji era um, and likely early Meiji era. Which everything about that piece denotes an earlier piece of Meiji era cloisonne. Um, they hadn't perfected open backgrounds yet, I don't think, because you can see that this also is kind of busy, although in a much more naturalized style. <laughs> so then, um, you know, uh, Japan actually led the what is known as the golden era of cloisonne. So they figured out how to make open backgrounds with enamel. Um, before then, you know, there had to be some sort of support for the enamel. Otherwise, it would just run off during the firing process or you know, leak into other sections. I, I'm not exactly sure what happens that, um, <laughs> that was my dog. Um, I'm not exactly sure what happens. I'm just speculating as a person that kind of understands like science and pastes and liquids and what happens when things are heated up. So, so I imagine what happens, um, when you don't use a background cloison is that it just runs all over the place and it doesn't stay where you wanted it to be. So at some point in time, Japan um, did a bunch of research and they figured out how to make large open portions of cloisonne. So you can see that this uh, Eagle Charger, um, while he is pretty heavily cloisoned, I mean, he's got feathers and you know all sorts of stuff all over the place, but there's a giant light blue open background and it, before Japan got a hold of cloisonne, that was impossible. So large open backgrounds are in a pretty definite sign that the piece is Japanese and likely even Meiji era. Although they do make um, just kind of plainish uh, wireless cloisonne in Japan these days. 
like even now, Ando Cloisonnet is alive and well, which is delightful. Um, so then we'll move on to, um, let's see, just make sure I kind of talked about borders. You'll notice that this, uh, this mushroom border is just slightly different than the others, but it's still kind of in that same vein. And I forgot to mention that while we were still talking about the Chinese pieces. And then in the bottom, that's quite a bit different than, um, than most of the other mushroom borders and stuff. But yeah, that's more common of, a. Uh, like Chinese closing their backgrounds. So yeah. Um, let's see here. We've got this little fella. Now this is a this is a pretty different thing. I believe he's got copper flakes in his background, and that's called going goldstone technique. But you'll also notice that there's certain portions of this that are kind of open. So uh Japan, during the golden age of cloisonne, also invented black enamel. And I believe that after they opened up their borders, because uh, they were a closed-off nation for hundreds of years, they didn't trade with anyone, uh, a little bit with the Dutch. And, uh, and yeah, they just uh, they didn't really talk to the rest of the world about science or, or anything like that. So then... Um, during the uh, Meiji era, they opened up trade and they started talking to other people. And I believe what happened is they, some company, um, it may have been an artist or a studio. Um, I'm fairly certain that one of the, um, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't tell you exactly who it was, but I think somebody hired a German scientist or a German chemist and he came to Japan and helped them figure out a formula for black enamel. So Japan was the, uh, I believe, the first place to have black enamel. And you can see that this one doesn't have a clear coat or anything. It's just a slightly polished um, black enamel. And you can see again that there's large open spaces. I mean, larger than you find typically on any Chinese piece. And this thing's only, you know, four inches tall or so. But I think it's about five inches tall, but still. You can see that's quite a bit different of a uh, border or fence. And if you see irises like this, uh, especially with the intricate wire work inside of them, that's almost always Japanese. I don't think I've ever seen a uh, Chinese piece that represented the flowers that way. And obviously we've got a few um, black pieces because I wanted to highlight that a bit since it was a Japanese invention. Um, so yeah. Uh, and you can see the, almost the entire back of this one is a beautiful black uh, just empty background. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, looking at those two black ones, then you see that this is an earlier Meiji era piece than those two, I think. And um, you can see that the black enamel is already in effect, and the goldstone technique has been used in the background. You can see the little shinies as it spins. Now, I think a lot of the time this was copper or... Um, uh, I forget the name of the stone, but uh, but what they would do is lay the stones in the black enamel and then sand away at it until some of that copper shone through. And that was known as the goldstone technique. And um, and sometimes I believe that the uh, a layer of enamel would contain actual flakes of gold or gold leaf. And uh, I think those are two just slightly varying techniques on how to get kind of shinies like that. You'll see, um, again, right here, we've got, uh, these, these beautiful irises with the, uh, intricate wire work. And obviously that's again, Japanese, but if we turn it, then we see there's a large open background again. Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah. Now this, this is a bit different. This is 
is a piece of Jinbari cloisonne, which I think is strictly uh, Japanese. I believe what they've done, uh, there's a couple of different uh, slightly varying techniques, and I think pretty much just everyone refers to both of them as Jinbari. But either they can <clears throat> um, give the vase underneath this texture, so like this vase might actually have all that texture, or it might just be the foil that has that texture. But um, I'm not sure what that other technique's called, where it's the vase that would have the texture as opposed to the uh, foil. But either way, what you would end up with is a shiny background on a uh, cloisonne vase. And sometimes it'll have wired cloisonne, and sometimes it won't. But uh, this technique, I believe everyone would just agree, is called Jinbari Cloisonne, or sometimes Jimbari Cloisonne. It's G-I-N-B-A-R-I, as far as I've learned to spell it. But yeah, um, if it's shiny foil in the background, that's pretty much exclusively Japanese as well. <clears throat> and then we've got uh, this other example of Jinbari Cloisonne which they've just cut little squares of the foil and put them in the background and then covered that with enamel. Now this one obviously also has wired cloisonne or Yusen Jippo uh, in, in front of or, you know, overlapping. And these could be called roundels or even mons. And then you see this slightly different border here. Uh, the little circles, the little circles are why I picked this, because that's very common to, uh, to Japanese cloisonne, the small circle border. So yeah, this is Austin. Um, you know, hopefully just introducing you to some different <laughs> stylizing and techniques. Um, you know, I hope this is a pretty fair representation. Oh, I did mean to show you this, uh, this somewhat larger red base. Um, this is called Oxblood. I think uh, I think Japan was pretty well responsible for this too. You'll see there's a slightly differing border up there. Now I've seen somewhat similar borders to that on Chinese pieces. So now, this piece does have some damage, but but I loved it a lot and I got it anyway. And these are both pretty cheap. I have a pair of these and they were thirty and forty dollars, I believe. But yeah, um, you can see the, oh, okay. <laughs> Accidents abound. You can see the cloisons there, but, but more importantly, I had picked this out because of the giant red um, empty background, which is pretty impressive and would have been extraordinarily difficult uh, originally. So. so it's worth noting that again, big open backgrounds. That's, that's pretty well going to be Japanese. So yeah, this is Austin, the best thing in the 40 Antiques channel, hopefully educating you a little bit. Um, you know, it's a shame we don't have slightly better pieces to uh, show you on the Chinese side, because really some Chinese cloisonne is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, but yeah, this is Austin and the Best Second of 40 Antiques channel, and I hope you'll like, share, comment, subscribe, do whatever you want. You know, I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoy some of these. I've got like, I think I really have like 200 videos now. So, I mean, if you'd like to learn more about any of these particular pieces, you know, if you'd like to, if you'd like to just stare at something pretty for a while, or if you just want to listen to me talk while you're on your phone, uh, you know, do what you want. This is Austin. Right. So that was Austin from Best I Can Afford Antiques. Um, a fascinating guy. Um, such interesting content. As he said, he's got over 200 um, videos on his channel. Um, uh, he, he's extremely entertaining and very kind hearted, very funny. There's a certain um, level of chaos as you could see there in a lot of his videos, which is just so endearing. It's so much fun. Um, now, what I've got for you is um, a selection of uh, pictures to illustrate the Chinese uh, borders, the Japanese borders, the Chinese grounds, and the Japanese grounds, just to help cement the information that he's just given us um, about showing the two, um, the differences between the two. 
So let's see if we've still got, ah, okay. So here we've got a large Clazone uh, chrysanthemum bowl, um, which again shows this Chinese mushroom designed border. Now, oh, this is a beautiful pair of um, Clazone uh, dragon vases. Um, again, it shows these mushroom cloud-like uh, uh, borders and a fish scale border at the bottom. And I think I touched on this possibly on the uh, triptych I did about the auctions where you can always tell a Chinese dragon has the five toes or five claws, whereas a Japanese always has a three. Again, a beautifully designed piece. Um, with um, the mushrooms. This has got a lovely, almost a canthus leaf border as well. You can see that this has got fantastic detail. I'm not sure if I'm actually going to be able to get much closer on this, but there we go. There's a five-toed or five-clawed dragon there. And this is a beautiful example. This is a very interesting ground here. To, although I've got this tab under um, this picture under my borders tab, this is a very interesting ground of, of cloisons, one that I haven't seen on very many pieces. Uh, a lovely little plate. This shows the um, the, the plain um, half circle uh, border which is again very common on small pieces and we've got a good uh, uh, image of the uh, ground as well that the Chinese use. You'll find that this cloud design and grounds can be either spaced out quite well like this or it could be quite tightly put together. And again, this is a beautiful piece with a fish scale uh, border on it. And this is a Greek key border, which is, again, is quite common in Chinese um, cloisonne. Um, on this, this is a, the base of a vase. If we move on to Japanese borders. You can see the more elaborate border on this particular vase. I don't know if there's a picture that shows it a little bit better here. Uh, this is a great picture. This is a Chinese uh, Clazone piece next to a Japanese Clazone piece. Um, very now, interesting comparison. That one that you're showing there, and this also was in uh, one of the ones Austin showed, the yellow in that floral design, the, uh, the big piece in the front, appears to have two different colors within the same cloison. Is that how are they doing that? That I think he explained um, that it would be fired, it would be taken out, it would be polished, and then more uh, a different color would be um, applied to it, and it would be fired again and polished again. Oh, yes. within the same clothes. Okay, that, I that is that. remarkable. It's it's quite beautiful, and it's, I find this a particularly interesting picture putting the, the Chinese next to the Japanese. I mean, they're both extremely beautiful vases. I'm, I've got to admit, there's something about the Japanese that appeals to me slightly more. Um, I just, the, the almost, I like the busyness of the design, even though when you get to some of the wireless pieces, the elegance where there is either no design or just a design on one on one part of a piece, and the rest is completely wireless. As he mentioned, the um, the Japanese took the Chinese tradition and really ran with it and made it their own. Another a beautiful um, border on this um, Japanese piece. And again, you can see this is such a good rule to, to work by the three claws of a Japanese dragon in comparison with the five claws of a Chinese dragon. I found that 
that tiny bit of information has 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 proved so valuable to me over the years. This is a piece that's extremely similar um, in, in concept to the Raptor piece that he had, this flying crane with this extensive um, clear um, wireless uh, ground to it and this very subtle border along the edge. Uh, this is a, a classic um, Meiji period um, design with, again, this has got a fish scale um, border to it. And a Meiji period uh, sugar pot with um, almost what could be um, confused with a Chinese mushroom border, but it's more floral. Um, and the fact you've got this dark ground with these flowers really screams that this is a Japanese piece rather than a Chinese piece. This is a very elegant pair of vases, lots of vacant space, lots of wireless space here of these. Um, I'm not sure what these birds are, probably a finch of some sort. Um, these are extremely elegant vases. Um, 877 New Zealand dollars and probably worth every cent of that. Uh, this is another Meiji period piece. Um, you can tell with this dark ground, um, very simple borders, lots of roundels with flowers and these mons, these Japanese mons. Very elegant pair of vases again. This is a very unusual border. Um, I found this on, I think, only this example, maybe two examples, um, but this is, is definitely a Chinese piece as well. Very elegant and small little Meiji period with this dot and circle border. This is a particularly pretty vase with the butterfly. And you can see very similar to the underside of the charger that Austin showed um, with these uh, swirls, this open swirl work. Again, another very handsome uh, Japanese vase with um, these almost geometric style borders to it. very elegant teapot this is one of the few examples that i saw this continuous circular cloison design through the handles and the spout again a very complex design in the um, border of this piece but lots of open space with the wireless ground slightly better picture of this one classic um, Japanese border there lots of space and this is a, another beautiful vase with a very traditional border okay so if we move on to some of the grounds this is what you'll see in the background um, the cloisons together um, this wavy line is not a common Chinese ground, but you do see it. This is a vase that I pictured earlier, but this, um, again, I've, I did not see very many examples with this particular ground to it. Now, the example, the first example you gave with the very long stretches of the squiggly line, is that indicate to me that... <laughs> It almost seems lazy. Like you could, you would end up having these huge long sections as opposed to all the details. Like, is this a slightly less expensive way of making the I'm not, poisons? I'm, not, I'm really, I'm not sure. Um, the person who would be twisting and bending the wire may well have almost spent as much time on doing this as they would if they were making circular pieces. I really don't know. I'm sure it was just selected 
for the effect that the particular artisan wanted to um, to put forth. These are um, lotus blossoms, and they probably wanted something that looked like water. And it does. And it does. This is a lovely photo. I wonder if I can just increase the size of this just a little bit. Again, showing this is a very cloud-like this is an interesting one here. I wonder if there's a single photo of just of this one with a sort of a poor like um, uh, background where they're quite well spaced out. These are quite spaced out. Again, they come much tighter in some, some examples. This is the diapering, uh, the diaper ground that he talked of. This is quite a common um, ground to find on Chinese pieces, um, although it looks to be one of the more complex. Now, how do they get each one of those wire sections to be almost exactly the same? Uh, well, that would be um, in the initial cutting of those okay. pieces of copper. Um, they do grind some of that down. That Some of that is sanded down with the soapstone and polished away. Um, if I can get these, I think this is a magnificent pair of um, covered jars with, again, this diapering background quite a traditional mushroom border at the top there. Uh, here is um, a background where it's probably a little tighter. This cloud uh, design in the grounds are, are, is slightly tighter than some that I've seen. And here's one where the cloud design is very loose, very spaced out, and very, very um, sparse. This, I think, is probably less successful as a design than when they are closely and tightly put together. This has swirls here. I looked at this for some time. Um, I don't believe they actually identified this as being Chinese or Japanese. Um, and this is very much, uh, looks very much like Japanese to me here. So at the end of the day, I, th I think it's Japanese, although I put it in with the Chinese grounds because I really wasn't that sure. What do you think, um, guys? I would almost consider that slightly Japanese in its design. Yeah, yeah. I think I may well have um, put that in the wrong category. I tossed and turned over that one a little bit. Well, just so you know, Austin from Best I Can Afford has joined the chat. Oh, great. Thanks very much for joining us, Austin. Um, I just showed your um, video clip, um, which was accepted um, really wonderfully. Thank you so much for coming along, and thank you so much for allowing us to um, use your uh, video as a resource here. I really appreciate it. Here again is um, uh, Clazone Rabbit with the Clazones very loose applied in these curls. Again, this one is probably better if I... Uh, very sparsely populated um, Clazones here. These are not packed together like some of the other examples have been. And it seems like that one is missing something and it's enameling. It is. Uh, there's damage there. There's damage to the ground there. These are, uh, I think we need to remember that it is basically glass. And even though they are certainly more robust than perhaps a glass vase, they can be damaged. And as far as I know, they can't be repaired. I did do some research into whether Trezone could be repaired or not. And I think the short answer was basically, no, it can't be. Um, this was the piece that when I was looking at the original description of crudeness or lumpiness as being a sign of a modern piece, this to me seems extremely crude and, ex and extremely lumpy and pale um, in the um, application of the enamels. 
Uh, this, is a, this is a really interesting ground. I found only one example online of this particular design of ground. Um, very effective. It's quite a beautiful bowl, this. That's Again, a really neat background. Yeah, I like very, that black with the red, the yellow, and that orange. Really striking. <laughs> It's very striking with a quite a classic sort of a um, Chinese chrysanthemum in the middle. Uh, again, this is a beautiful pair of, dra of dragon vases. Um, one, this is probably one of the favorite images that I came across. Uh, again, with a five toes. Uh, I love the fish scaling um, board, the mushroom border, the color combinations, the black ground. It's um, these are beautiful, and again. $350 um, seems like an exceptionally fair price for this to me. This was a very elegant piece of Chinese cloisonne, this raised urn with lid. Um, I'm not sure if we can get a particularly good view. Ah, look at the very tightly packed swirls of cloisonne pieces um, with these little flowers. Qu quite beautiful. Uh, again, this is one of the more beautiful pieces that I found. Now we're going to just move on to a few Meiji period pieces. We've seen this with the black background, with the, the circles, the flowers. This is particularly pretty with these fan, these fan um, uh, vignettes throughout the piece with the very beautiful daisies. Again, this um, is an exceptional piece of cloisonne at 12 inches. It's a uh, wonderful large. Again, the same teapot I showed earlier, a very good example of Meiji period, as is this. Again, a three-toed or three-clawed dragon. This is an impressive pa pair of um, vases. This has the gold tone flecking that Austin talked about in his video that you can see. They see they're very impressive, as tall as a bottle of wine. That flecking is pretty amazing, and I would love to see a video of how they actually do that with the enamel. Yeah, so would I. It would be fascinating. These are exceptionally beautiful pieces. I came across, no, I've lost it now. That's interesting. Ah, I must have done something silly. There we go. This early 20th century piece of Japanese cloisonne with the um, background cloisons just indicating the water behind him, a figural piece. Um, this I, I recognized as being early at the moment I saw the um, photo of it due to this figure and the almost naivety of the design. Another beautiful piece indicating with um, butterflies and flowers. This is an exceptional vase as well. Very, very busy, but very elegant. Another pair of vases that's just beautiful. Again, I found so many pictures of beautiful vases that I just probably should have stopped somewhere earlier than this. That last set is absolutely beautiful. They're exquisite. Very classic box here with the black background, the tightly curled cloisonne, and the circle, circular mon design with the flowers. Now we're going to move on to some images of the wireless cloisonne that um, Austin talked about. This is... Um, uh, totally um, wireless on the back with a very simplistic design of a flower on the front. Quite often the cloisons themselves on Japanese pieces are silver rather than copper. So this may be a stupid question, Nate, but and this was something I thought of when Austin was showing it as well. What makes it wireless cl uh, cloisonne as opposed to just plain enamel? The fact that there are cloisons somewhere in the piece? Well, I think it's the fact that the remaining, the cloison that's there from the design that's placed on it, the rim and the base acts like a super cloison. And in fact, it is just enameling. Um, and the, 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 the Japanese um, 
perfected this technique that the Chinese never really could because they needed to have the busyness of all of the designs, of all of the cloisons there, simply to hold the piece together to be able to be fired. So I'm wondering how that compares to something like what some of us may know as more contemporary, the Limoges boxes, Halcyon days, yeah. Steinbach enameling from, uh, from Austria. There's no cloisons at all. So the piece is just enameled. Is that technically wireless enam wireless cloisonne because the frame is what's holding it all together? It, it could well be. And those techniques of enameling could come, could have come directly from uh, Japanese wireless cloisonne. I'm really not sure. Interesting. That's this a great a, question, Patrick. This is a um, beautiful vase where um, I think this design here may well be in the foil on the back of this particular vase. Here's the front. You can see the textured foil here behind the, um, the, the translucent enamel here gives us extremely elegant effect. The flowers almost look like they're just coming right off of the vase as if they were alive. Yeah, the details on the roses are quite incredible, down to the thorns, really quite beautiful. This is an interesting one as well, where um, it's wireless. I believe this maple leaf design is actually in the foil itself. I think that's an unrelated image. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, this pair of pigeon blood. Again, this has a design embossed. It's a bamboo design embossed into that um, foil. I'm not sure if I can actually pick that up particularly well. Are you able to see that? It ah, shows up a little. Yeah, barely. There, I think that's a little bit more. Yeah, those would be rough to photograph. Yeah, definitely. But they're an extremely elegant pair of vases. I'm not sure how tall these are. Now, we're, from what you have figured out, or with Austin being in the chat, what era is something like this? Because visually, this looks extremely contemporary. Is this also, there's, is there his, historic background to this? I am not 100% sure. I think Austin may be better qualified to answer that. Um, certainly, it is after the Meiji period. Perhaps this it was looking at post-1912. Maybe this is the 1920s to 30s. I'm really not, not sure. Or these could have been made last week. Certainly the standard of, of Clizone making today is very strong. Another example of an embossed foil. These are, again, very elegant tall vases. Austin did comment. He said, "Likely thirties and up into the contemporary period." Fantastic, thanks, Austin, buddy. This is quite a modern piece. I think this is from the sixties or seventies, uh, circa nineteen seventy. Um, this has not the quality of pieces earlier, in my opinion, and I'm sure you would agree. And it's raised. Mm. Not quite as elegant as earlier designs. Uh, this is a very good image to show some of the textured um, foil backing of that wireless piece. Oh, I've got that picture in again. I liked it so much. This clematis curling around here with the birds is a particularly beautiful image. This has a really lovely border as well. Ah, this is a gold-flecked example, um, quite beautiful of these two cranes. And this is the Ando that Austin mentioned, where there is no cloison whatsoever, no design on any side or shape of this. It is just simply an enameled piece, extremely elegant. This 
is a very handsome vase. I don't think this is particularly old, but it's extremely beautiful. I love the peacock on that. Yeah, quite stunning. Uh, this um, up close shot um, is a very good photo of the texture of the um, the texture that they've given to the foil backing here and the translucent overlay and the green and translucent overlay. Another beautiful vase, wireless with um, wisteria on one side and a basket of flowers. And this is a completely silver example, I think. This is made from, um, this is made by a master uh, Japanese um, artist who I did write the name down of, and I think it is Tawagashi Bansenum. So did several uh, makers or uh, particularly skilled artisans have a certain design they were known for, and so it's sort of like Tonala, where they sign it, and that becomes their piece? There are signatures on some pieces of, um, well, there are text, I should say, on, on the bottom of some pieces of Clazone, especially Chinese, but it's, I don't believe it's ever actually the signature of the artist. They're more usually rain marks, emperor's marks, which are often used um, well and truly after um, a particular dynasty is gone. Um, it more is an homage to a style of that particular dynasty. So that's it for the differences between the Japanese and the Chinese um, Clazone. I hope you, some of you have been able to find and been able to identify some of those for pieces that you see yourself later. Now we move on to Champlevé enamel. This is a very short and small section. I found very few examples of uh, Champlevé. The Champlevé itself, um, it means um, a raised field. So, um, uh, and although the name is, is based on the fact that it's a raised field, the technique and practice lowers or creates um, a lower area to flood with enamel. And this may be carved, it may be stamped, it may be hammered, it may be etched away to receive the enamel. And what I've found in looking for images on Champlevé examples is they are almost always a bolster-shaped vase with two stylized handles on them, like this example here. This example here where the, the handles have become quite modified, but still it's a bolster shape. This example here, where the base has been actually uh, given lots of different texture. And again, um, when you look and think of um, comparing Clazone to Champlevé, you can see that although this part here looks somewhat similar, the um, pieces of metal that would delineate the enamel are very thick and very wide, whereas those that form the cloisons of the cloisonne are very fine and very thin. This is another up-close piece of Champlevé. Um, to my so the eye, difference, so the other difference, um, it's because the metal that's marking the edges of the Champlevé were already part of the piece. They were just carved out as opposed to the cloisonne that was being added. That's right. That's exactly right. These pieces seem clumsy to me after seeing so many beautiful pieces of cloisonne. Um, these are just simply not as appealing. Uh, when I did the um, view, the, the triptych on the auction house um, here in Auckland, and you, Patrick, had accused me of making up the term Champlevé when I found <laughs> a couple of examples of Champlevé. Still thinking you did. That's why you can't find many examples. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I do want to uh, throw out, for those who are, might be watching the video without following the chat, uh, Austin added a couple of points regarding okay. uh, the manufacturing that uh, Japanese pieces are typically marked by their maker uh, Chinese we marked by the reign or dynasty, but only 10 to 30% of Japanese pieces would be signed. 
that's fascinating. Thanks, Austin. Thank you so much. The pieces that I saw at auction um, were reasonably crude and chunky like these, but they sold for extremely high prices. I was really surprised. So comparing uh, Champlevet to Cloisonne in prices, uh, are you comparing the age or the technique or what has a higher value? Um, I'm not sure if it's just a matter of desirability, um, to be honest. Um, Cloisonne pieces go through the auction house quite often, certainly more often than Champlevet, um, and they seem to get reasonably average prices. Um, whereas I was surprised that the two lots of Champlevet went reasonably high. That was in the mid to high hundreds, whereas I've seen Cloisonne pieces go for the uh, under 100 or lo the low hundreds at the most. Again, a lamp, um, a, a Champlevet lamp. Wait, a lamp? What? How much light could that thing have really given out? <laughs> yeah, I'm not too sure if there's actually fabric here underneath, um, but it looks pretty chunky and ugly to me, to be honest. And how common are the lamps compared to the vases and the plates? I found very ex few examples of any of them, to be honest, and that was um, one of two lamps that I found. So that is the sum total of what I can tell you about Champlevet. And then we move into uh, Plicajour enamel. Um, so Plicajour means in French, um, letting in the daylight. And um, it was originally made, first discovered and made in the 15th century by a guy called... Uh, been Benito Cellini and was lost basically until rediscovered in France in the 1900s. And the technique soared to popularity um, in the Art Nouveau period and was almost always, or was quite often made for jewellery. It was a popular technique of Tiffany and Carl Fabergé. I've got some beautiful examples here of pieces of jewellery in this particular technique. It's like Cloisonne, but it has no backing to it. So it um, attains more of an appearance like stained glass. This is a lovely little bowl. There's a number of really beautiful little bowls made um, in this applique jour technique. I'm a big fan of this technique. It is it is common to the Art Nouveau period, and it is beautiful in jewelry. I actually sent. I don't know if you showed it, Nate, but I actually showed a, a sent a piece to Nate that was in a uh, Russian uh, coronet crown that we we're debating whether that was actually going to be considered plique jour or not. It's just that light coming through it just has the completely different look. It's Indeed. almost like in glass, just stunning. It is very similar to stained glass, and it was very popular amongst Russian artisans and jewelers. This exceptional piece here, set with diamonds. <coughs> Excuse me. And this pair of Plicajour vases. Uh, these pieces here um, caught my eye. This was on a site uh, that um, they come from a site of a company that actually teaches the plique jour technique. These particularly reminded me of the um, designs and stylings of uh, Charles René Mackintosh, who is a famous uh, Scottish architect and designer. And this color palette and this particular designs that w were very common in his work. Nate, we have a question coming in from the chat uh, from Krista, and she was wondering if you can explain the differences between enamel and uh, porcelain. Well, um, enamel is uh, ground glass, ground glass and minerals 
um, that have been um, ground together and then reheated to form a smooth uh, surface solid, um, whereas porcelain would be um, um, material, um, earth material and bone that has been shaped and fired. Um, so porcelain is like china or a refined form of pottery where this is more um, glass and mineral based as far as I could comfortably explain it. It's a great question. You can also have a piece of porcelain that has been enameled. So they, they wouldn't be necessarily separate you could have one that's decorated with that high gloss finish. And if it's not a high gloss paint, it could be an enameled uh, decoration. Well, I, I found pieces of Chinese pieces of that were referred to as cloisonne, but they were on porcelain pieces. But that was just such a mind bend for me that I deliberately left it out. Well, I think that's one of the problems. I mean, we, we do joke about it, but Champlevé, I, I know, is not a made up term, but so few people know it that if they have a piece, it's unlikely that it's going to be listed as Champlevé because they just right. think it's a piece of brass that has enameling on it. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, to find the term is going to be fairly rare simply because people don't know the term exists. That's why this show. That's why this show exists. And what I found really interesting that there were examples of pieces that were Champlevé that also had the Cloisonne techniques applied to them as well. This is a lovely little Russian piece. This is like a quake or a quash. Um, uh, Russian clique jour, absolutely elegant. Uh, 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 Johann Olsonius in St. Petersburg, absolutely beautiful. Nate, are you still with us? Uh oh. Oh, no, I think we've lost Nate, folks. Well, we're still here, so hopefully if he kicked himself out, he'll get himself back on really quickly. I've had enough technical difficulties myself. I know that uh, it can happen, so we'll see if we can get himself back in. It can. It does happen, certainly, with these live streams. But I am finding this incredibly interesting, and I think Patrick made a great point that a lot of these uh, aren't listed properly because... People don't really understand the differences, and I think that this has been a great layout of the different techniques. Yeah, I think when I, fr I don't remember the first time I heard uh, Pli Cajour, um, but it was one of those cases where it was a piece of jewelry, and I want to say it was a dragonfly, and it was the wings were done in um, the see-through enamel, and they also moved so it was, uh, wow. it's called en, en tremblant. So as you walked, the wings would actually flutter back and forth. And so you'd see it with the light coming through them. And it was just, it's just amazing. I think but, the first time I had seen that as well, uh, Patrick, was through a, a piece of jewelry. I'd never seen the vases or the bowls. There's a comment from Cheryl, which I think is worth sharing for those who might not be following the chat. Is she specifically talking about how porcelain is fired, by going back to the question of porcelain and enamel? I mean, porcelain is basically a type of clay, but it has a higher percentage of kaolin and it would be fired at higher temperature than other clays. Now, I don't know how that compares to the higher, uh, the firings of the different types of enameling in the cloisonne. Um, but I know that some there is an art form to how you do that and what steps you would take because in, you could start with very porcelain can be high, fired at much much higher temperatures so it can handle a lot more treatments. But you start the first treatment with the highest uh, firing, and then as you add other pieces, you might refire it at lower temperatures that couldn't it wouldn't be able to sustain it if you fired at the high level. Yes, and I know that's true too with pottery when you do type any type of uh, overlay or you add some gold uh, pieces or silver elements to it to get that burnished gold or silver look, you would uh, apply that uh, later on. You do the same with any type of uh, decal and pottery as well because they have to be fired at different temperatures. 
I know that one of the things that Nate still had to show us was he actually had a video about the production uh, technique of plique So it's unfortunate if uh, we have lost him, but we may need to have him post that link in the description of the video um, because I don't think we've got uh, how much longer we're able to keep people in, enthralled with just our conversation. <laughs> so I, I, one of the things we can talk about is what's coming up. Um, I am hosting the next Tales from the Triptych and it's actually inadvertently, it's actually going to be somewhat related to some of what uh, Nate has been talking about because I will be talking about uh, Russian Fabergé eggs. And so the Fabergé eggs in some cases were also enameled and in some cases used plique jour, uh, but that's not what the presentation will be on. But spring is coming, coming soon enough here in Chicago. And uh, we will be, uh, that will be next week, uh, next Sunday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern on the Trusty Huckster Mercantile channel. And that will be uh, Fabergé eggs. Uh, what do you have coming up on your channel, uh, Katie? That is a wonderful triptych topic, Patrick, and I'm really looking forward oh, to that. Nate's coming oh, back. Nate's back. Okay. We I stalled had... long enough. <laughs> Nate came back. I had more technical difficulties. I'm sorry. I think I'm back. I'll try and go back to this um, presentation on uh, the plique your earrings. I'm not sure where I actually dropped off, unfortunately. How much of this video did you get to see? We, we saw, saw most of the plique jour. You hadn't shown the video about the technique. Yes. Uh, the, I think you were going to get a video about um, yep. how it was made. Yeah, here we go. I'm um, sorry about that. I did get a little alert saying that there was something wrong with my connection, um, but I was happily talking away to you for at least five minutes. <laughs> I've before. done that. Before. No worries. We've all done it. We've been there before. So we're <laughs> not seeing your video screen. Or we're not seeing your screen, though, Nate. Ah, okay. Let me try and go back. Um, let me go. Wow, technology. It can be a real struggle sometimes that we got technology is great until it's not. Yeah. No. yeah. Um now So now we're in the shared screen if you want to switch to the full screen. Uh no. Yep. Okay. There, there we go. We're is that right? Business. Okay, yep. fantastic. Now let's see if I can see. So start. this is the cool tools video. Yeah, Plique Azure. Yeah. This is yep, Karen Trexler's uh cool tools video. So sorry everyone for that little hiccup. Um, here we go. Now, she uh, makes a pair of earrings, uh, uh, explains the process wonderfully. Um, and there is a couple of things that I might pause and talk about um, as we go through. But let's just see if this will work. Is that working for you, you guys? Beautifully. Neat. Yep. Fantastic. Hi, I'm Karen, and I'm here at the Cool Tool Studio today to share a project with you guys that I'm really excited about. Today, we're going to be using fine silver precious metal clay. I'm recommending Cool Tools FS999 alongside Thompson unleaded transparent enamels to make plique jour enameled earrings. Plique jour. So, um, what she's talking about there is something that I'm not sure if you're familiar with. She's using a silver clay. Have you ever come across silver clay before? Yes. I have not. Ah, silver clay is a wonderful thing. That's great. You've you've come across it, Patrick. Yeah, there's um, an art, uh, kind of an art collective near here. Uh, my daughter and I've done Reiku pottery there, and they just they have all different types of classes on lamp work, uh, earrings, and glass. And this was one of its classes that they offered. But until then, I had not seen it. But it, you know, from my understanding, is it is worked like clay. So you can punch it, you can form it, you can roll it. But then when it fires, it has this uh, silver metal metallic appearance to it. That's right. Well, it is in fact silver when it's fired. So the silver clay is made up of thousands and thousands of tiny silver particles that's held together um, in an organic binder. Um, as the clay dries, the moisture from the a binder evaporates. And when it's heated, it burns away completely, leaving only silver behind. So it is indeed pure silver. It's not um, sterling silver because it's not um, alloyed with anything. It doesn't have any copper in it. It's a process called sintering whereby it's a, a coalescing of powdered material that's turned into a solid by heating without liquefaction. So rather than actually get a piece of sterling or pure silver 
shim flattened piece of silver, drilling that out, and then um, going through the um, process of pligazure. She's actually using um, the silver clay, which is an extremely clever idea. So we'll go back to her. Place to light of day, and I love this technique for the beautiful transparency you're able to achieve. Transparent enamel is placed into holes made in the silver and allows light to pass through, creating this beautiful kind of stained glass effect. I'm recommending earrings for this project because you wouldn't want to make charms for a bracelet or a low-hanging pendant that could potentially knock against something. Since this is glass with ins without a back, it's unsupported enamel, they're very fragile, and if you were to knock them against something, there is potential for them to break. Also, by hanging them from your ears and away from your body, there's opportunity for light to pass through, really showcasing the beautiful transparency of this technique. First, we will be cutting our pattern into fine silver precious metal clay, which is a huge time saver from the traditional clique du method where you're using a handsaw to pierce out the shapes that you want to fill with enamel. Then, once we've fired our fine silver precious metal clay, we're going to enamel these earrings by wet packing enamel into the cells that we've created. Finally, we will be stoning and sanding the surface of both the enamel and the metal to bring it down to one smooth, even surface. Here are the tools that we're going to need to complete this project. To start, we're going to need some FS999 fine silver clay. Since we're using enamel, it must be fine silver and not sterling silver. We're going to need some Thompson transparent unleaded enamels. And if you haven't done much enameling, I highly recommend purchasing the Thompson Complete Color Sampler that Cool Tools offers. It's a great little library of all of the colors. And if you haven't done much enameling, it's a great way to get you started. You can test them and see which colors you love before you start investing in purchasing larger amounts of them. I've made all of these earrings from the little baggies and still have plenty left of even my favorite colors. If you know what you like or eventually do run out of a color, they do sell them individually in the cute convenient little jars. We'll be wet packing our enamel, so we're going to need a palette and a small brush. This is a 20 o brush that they offer. You'll need a work surface, and I'm using the work surface alongside these punches and templates. Or alternately, you can be using a scalpel that you'll be working with on top of a self-healing mat. We're going to be firing our enamels on top of a sheet of mica that will be on top of a 4-inch firing rack. When you get to finishing your enamel, you're going to need alumdum stones, both 120 grit and 240 grit, and you're going to follow that up with 240 sandpaper and you work your way down to 800. Before we dive right in, there are some general design rules that you should keep in mind. First, your earrings need to be flat. When we're enameling them, the piece must be able to lay flat against a sheet of mica. Additionally, we don't want to put any texture into our clay. If enamel were to fall into the low areas of the texture, we will not be able to remove it. When you're planning your pattern, make sure you give yourself an edge. You don't want enamel too close to the edge so you run the risk of breaking it when you're stoning. Give yourself at least three millimeters for a border and around two millimeters between your enamel cells. Plan how your earring will be hanging because you need to put the holes in now as opposed to once they've been enameled. I'm going to be showing you two ways to go about this project. In the first, we're going to be using templates and punches that Cool Tools offers. And in the second, I'm going to be freehanding the design with a pencil and then using a scalpel. I'm starting with FS999 roll to three card stick. Any thinner than that, and by the time you've got it stoned and sanded, it's going to be really fragile. In this case, I am working with a template. I'm using fat shields, and I'm just going to gently place it on top of the greenware clay. I'm just going to use a pencil to mark my outline that I'm then going to follow and cut. At this point, you could either use a scalpel on a self-healing mat, as I had mentioned, but I forgot that there are also these awesome Joyce Chen scissors that cut great curves. So I'm going to head, go ahead and use them to cut out this outline. And just following that line that I made with the pencil. I find that in this case, it's easier to go ahead and establish your outside edge that way, when you're punching your holes, you're making sure you're not getting too close to it. All right. 
And again, you want to make sure you don't forget how you're going to be hanging these pieces. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with the holes that my earring will be hanging from. And I'm using the precision hole punches here. All right, so there are those. And next I'm just gonna still be using the precision hole punches, but this time I'm gonna be creating the cells that'll be filling with enamel. The largest that I'm working with is about a quarter inch. Any larger than that, and since there won't be any metal to support your enamel, it's likely to crack. Again, be mindful of your edge. I don't wanna get too close to that because then by the time I'm stoning, you could break through that. So I'm just punching out cells that will then be filled with enamel. So I don't feel like I should make you guys watch me do this all day. I think you can kind of get the point that I'm just going to go about creating these little holes that will then be filled with enamel. And I'm just going to fill the whole area. All right. So this guy's good to go now. He's got all of his holes punched, and we're going to move on to the other method that I was talking about. So as I was saying earlier, this technique always reminds me of stained glass. So I kind of based this design off of stained glass windows that I just simplified. Um, I just used a pencil to super gently put the lines in. You want to make sure you're not scratching too hard and actually going to affect the surface of the clay. And then I've got my scalpel here, and I'm going to be cutting out those cells. Unlike before, where I cut the outside first, since we're removing so much more material, I recommend starting with the inside shapes and then we'll cut the edge so we don't tear it as we're removing material. I find it's easier to make all my cuts in one direction first. So we're just following your pencil lines. And they're just kind of a general map for you. So also notice that I'm not cutting out these cells like completely one at a time. Um, for example, we'll go ahead and try one. If I were to remove this guy all the way and then try to cut out his neighbor, since this isn't there to support that anymore, when I go to do this piece, it's going to want to pull that, and I could tear at that junction. So it just makes yourself your life a little easier if you go ahead and kind of give yourself your lines to cut before you actually start pulling out material. So just go ahead and cut out all of these areas, and then we'll catch back up. Now that I've got all of the inside pieces removed, we're going to cut the outside. But first, again, we really don't want to forget how our earring's going to be hanging. So, since I didn't really give myself enough room for precision hole punch here, I'm just going to gently make a hole with my needle. And then we're ready to dive right in with the scalpel again and cut out our outside edge. This edge has been cut away. This would be a good time to do any cleanup if you need to, but since we are working in greenware with a scalpel, and in this case, also in greenware, just with precision punches, you might not have that much cleanup to do. However, you can go ahead and clean up that edge. It'd be easier to do it now than after you fire it. All right, now these are good to go, and we're gonna fire them in accordance to the schedule for FS999. This has been fully fired and cool, and now we're ready to dive into the enameling, which in my opinion is a fun part. We basically have a glorified coloring book here. Um, so we're working on top of a sheet of mica, and that's just to keep it so even while we're working as well, your enamel's not gonna run behind it, and it kind of gives you a backing to work on top of. In my palette here, I've got rose purple, concord grape, and heron blue, and I've just added a little bit of water. If you'll notice, 
my enamel's not too wet. I'm able to pick it up and it sticks to itself, but it's not so runny that it's going to slide all over on me. And that's going to be important because if you were to be working very wet, when you go to put it in your cells, it could slide behind and then you would have to spend a lot of time stoning all that off. So I'm just picking up the enamel with my brush. I know some people like to use packing tools, um, but I find that when you're working this small, it's easiest to just pick it up with a brush and place it into the cells that you made. This is going to have several layers of packing and firing. So you want to work thin. Make sure you go all the way up to your edges. If you have a thin spot there, when you get to stoning, it could potentially crack away. So some people like to size their enamel or wash it prior to use. Um, I'm not that particular, but if that's something you're interested in, we do have a video that shows you all about that. Um, essentially, the thicker particles tend to be more transparent, so people will wash out or sift out the thinner ones. I'm not that worried about it, so I'm just using it straight out of the jar. So again, you want to make sure you fill the hole completely and try to spread it to be even. If you have a thin spot, it's going to fire before the thicker area and it could probably pull away from the edge. You're not going to fill it all the way to the top because again, we're trying to work kind of thin. That'll decrease our chances of getting bubbles and cracks. So I just got some on top of my metal there. No big deal. Just gonna dip into the water section here, my rinse part of my palette, and then wipe it away. You will make your life so much easier if you get rid of stray enamel at this point instead of having to stone it all away. So I'm just gonna continue this and fill all my cells. And make sure you're filling all the cells evenly. If I were to put just this much in this guy and leave them like that, whereas this guy is much thicker, by the time this guy is fusing, this guy's going to be completely overfired and shrunk away. So try to keep things consistent. Now I'm just going to go ahead and fill up all of these cells. So now I've got all of my cells filled. And again, I tried my best to be consistent and even about that. And then I went ahead and cleaned up all the little grains that I could off of the metal surface. So now we're good to take this piece directly still on top of the mica to the kiln to fire. But before we head over there, I'm going to talk to you about the fact that we're only firing to orange peel. For those of you who don't know what that means, three stages of firing enamel. The first of which is called a sugar coat, and that is when the enamel just kind of begins to fuse to itself. It's still very readily identifiable as individual grains. Um, looks like sugar. <laughs> The next step is called orange peel, and that is when it's kind of starting to fuse together into one surface, but there's still some lumps and bumps, and that's what we're shooting for. We're only firing to orange peel because we're working with many different colors of enamel, and those have different firing temps. If we were to fire them all fully, the lower firing enamels would be overfired and would pull away from the edges and make a mess for you, while the higher fire enamels might not even be past sugar fire. So by firing to orange peel, we're going to ensure that all of our colors are fired, but none of them are overfired. We're going to be firing our enamels at 1450. With this technique, it's really easy to accidentally overfire things, so I find it easier to run your kiln at a slightly lower temp than usual. Um, if you'll notice, my kiln reads 16 or 1460, um, but it's actually running at 1450. It's been calibrated. I've got my piece on my sheet of mica, and I'm going to place it on my firing rack here. And then I'm going to use my enameling fork to place this piece into the kiln. Lucky for me, this kiln's got a window, so it makes it super easy to keep an eye on things. And I'm going to watch and look for that orange peel that we were talking about earlier. So what I just did there 
Um, some of your pieces are going to be tempted to curl while they're in the kiln. And since you have to still pack consecutive layers and then need a smooth surface to pack on top of, um, it's best to flatten your enamel after each firing. I did so by placing the firing rack onto a heat resistant surface, pulled the mica off, and then squished it with another tile. All right, so while that one's cooling, we're gonna go ahead and revisit this other example. And this is gonna go basically exactly how the other one did. You're gonna use your brush to pick up the enamel and place it into those cells that you made. They're just a little bit larger this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish packing this, fire it, and then we'll catch up with it later. All right, once this is cooled completely, we're ready to bring it back over to the enameling station and add the second layer. So now we're ready for a second layer of enamel. As you can see, there's still plenty of room. We'll probably end up doing this two or three more times. And again, same as before, we're just filling the cell as evenly as we can. This guy's packed and ready to be fired again. Um, after that, you might have to repeat it another time or so, but what you're looking for is when all of your enamel is either at or slightly above the level of your metal. And on this guy, you can see that kind of orange peel texture where it's starting to smooth out, but there's still some bumps. From there, we're going to move on to stony and sanding, which will bring you to this final even smooth surface. Now we're ready to stone our enamel. And when you're stoning enamel, you always want to work underwater. The best way to do that is by positioning a board over your sink with your piece positioned underneath the flow of water. We're stoning underwater for several reasons. The first of which being that the water will help act as a lubricant and decrease your chances of getting chips in your enamel. The other reason is it will keep you from inhaling harmful glass particles. We're going to have two stones that we're working with, one a more coarse grit and the other fine. Just like sandpaper, the smaller the number, the more toothy or gritty it is. And then as the number gets higher, the texture gets finer. So we're gonna be starting with our 120 stone. And you wanna use the 120 stone just to kind of remove the initial enamel that's on the metal and start to even out the surface. This is way more aggressive than sandpaper. So you don't wanna to do too much or put very deep scratches into your piece. I'm going to use my non-dominant hand to kind of keep my piece from moving, and then I'm going to stone with my dominant hand. And I'm working in a circular pattern because it kind of helps you to stone it all evenly. And I'm trying to use a flat face of my stone because if I were to come in with a sharp point, I'll be making a very deep scratch so that'll be hard to get out, and I'm likely to gouge at my enamel. Just beginning to take down some of the enamel and even things out. Just rotate it some. Once this is starting to look sort of even, you'll flip it over and do the same to the back. Okay, so I've been sewing this for about five minutes or so, and I'm just about ready to move on to the next stone. All of the enamel has been removed from my metal and the surface is starting to get even. Um, there's still some high spots on the enamel, but we'll be able to take care of that with the next stone. We don't want to do too much work with the first stone because it is a higher grit and it's going to make some pretty deep scratches in your piece. I've been at this for about another five minutes or so and we are good to go. Done with the stones. We've got one smooth, even surface from the enamel to the metal. Everything's flat and looking good. Now that we're done stoning, we're ready to move on to sandpaper. We stoned in order to get rid of excess enamel, but in doing so, we created a bunch of scratches on the surface of the metal. So now we're gonna clean that up with sandpaper. We're gonna start with 240. I just fold it up, give it a little more, little more structural integrity. And again, same kind of circular motions. Mm -hmm. 
In this, you're just looking for an even surface. Your scratch marks should be decreasing, and things should start to look like they're evening out. So once it looks like all the scratches from the stone have been reduced, we're going to move on to the next level. And just like everything else that you've ever sanded, we're going to work our way from 240 to 800 until all the scratches are gone, and then we're going to finish things up with a polishing pad. This pair is wrapped up. I think they look great. Now it's time to move back to the pair that we were working on earlier. They've, again, they've been packed and fired four times, and we're ready to stone them. So let's move over to the sink. All right, so just like before, we're starting with our 120 stone to take away a bulk of the enamel. Same rules apply, circular motion, avoiding any gouging points. And one thing that I didn't mention when I was stoning the first project that's good to know is if as you're stoning and you notice, oh man, you know, there's a low spot in my enamel, maybe I need to add some more, or you knock a chip of it out, you can return to the enameling steps and add some more. But before you do so, you're going to want to use a fiberglass brush. And say I've got, oh, I was stoning there, man, there's a chip, and I'm going to have to add some more. Just use this brush and just really scrub out that surface. Because if you do, um, from stoning, you're going to have these scratches in the enamel. And if you skip this, you're going to fire in those little particles from the stone and it's going to make it all cloudy. And I'm scrubbing every place that I stoned, not just the one place that I'm adding enamel. Because that enamel is going to refuse too. So then if I wanted to, I'd be good to go back and add some enamel, and again, only fire to orange peel. So just as before, I'm going to be doing this strip for about five minutes or so, and then I'm going to move to the 240 stone before moving on to the 240 sandpaper and working my way to 800. And then once I've done that, don't forget about your other side. <laughs> Flip them over and do the same. So I finished these two up with polishing pads, just as I did these guys, and then attached them with jump rings to the roller chain that's connected to these snap settings. I'm really happy with the way that they turned out. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you'll give Pikachu a try. I'd love to see what you do with it. Wow. Visit our learning center. At well, I think we can all agree there's an enormous amount of work and skill and technique that goes into uh, Plique Jour jewelry. I thought that was extremely well explained by Karen. Um, and please go and subscribe to Cool Tools videos. Um, there's a lot of really interesting videos there. Well, that pretty much wraps up um, everything I have for you with this particular uh, triptych. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, thank you so much to Austin, especially for allowing me to use your video in this presentation. And thank you so much for coming along and joining the chat and supplying the extra information. We really appreciate it. Please go and subscribe to Austin's channel. Um, he deserves well more subscribers than he currently has. So it'd be great if you went along and um, subscribed to him. Um, and if anything, um, obviously you've seen how little I know about this particular subject, um, but if I've learned anything and I hope you take something away that you may be able to differentiate a piece of Chinese to Japanese cloisonne, um, or if just to appreciate the fact of how much work and effort goes into even the simplest and smallest piece of cloisonne. Um, so thank you everyone for coming along and watching uh, this presentation. Thank you, Katie and Patrick, for helping me Absolutely. out. You bet. Yeah, with my technical difficulties. Um, so Patrick, uh, what have you got coming up next? Uh, we have, did a little crash course while we were uh, had our technical difficulties with you, but that's okay, I'll repeat that next week, I will be hosting the Tales from the Triptych. And my topic for the next week is I'll be telling the tale of Fabergé eggs. So maybe a few of the pointers and pieces that uh, Nate gave us today on the enameling might show up in my presentation next week. And I will also be, uh, Katie is part of the duo dive uh, that she and I do. And this Wednesday, I will be hosting the duo dive also on the Trusty Huckster Mercantile channel. And we will be doing a, 
uh, dive into shipping regulations from the U.S. Postal Service. So for resellers who are interested in learning more or even buyers who are trying to educate themselves about what prices they should be paying for shipping, we will be covering that with a guest uh, on my channel on Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern, again on the Trusty Huckster Mercantile Channel. I am really looking forward to that, Patrick. I think that will be excellent. And uh, coming up next for me on my channel, I have a wonderful premiere video that will be happening on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern during my normal premiere time. And I will be going through my ephemeral, which is quite full. And then we are going to look at all of the different types uh, and uh, beautiful pieces of antique ephemera that I have. So if you're interested in that, make sure you come by on my channel for that premiere video at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. And then as Patrick mentioned, I will be part of the Duo Dive and the upcoming triptychs. So make sure you subscribe to uh, Nate and Patrick and myself. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone again for coming along. Thank you again, Austin. And I look forward to seeing you all again in a chat real soon. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.